continuing. Um, I'm continuing what I've been talking about in the last few weeks about the Holy Spirit and our salvation. And I want to continue this morning by talking about the Holy Spirit keeps us saved. And for those of us, some of us think, well, if I'm saved once, I'm saved for forever. Some of us think I can be saved, but I can walk away from God and lose my salvation. So depending on where you stand in that, don't lose your brains right now or let your blood pressure rise. Um, I just want us just to look at what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit's work in keeping us saved. Okay, we've been looking in these last few weeks at, um, oh, and our clock is working normally, I think. Okay, nevertheless, I'll take off my watch. Um, we've been looking at the Holy Spirit's work in bringing us to salvation, and we've spent a lot of time talking about that. Uh, we've talked, uh, Stephen, if that needs to go to low fan, you can, yes, over there. Okay. Stephen, you just walk around the church and be the cool man, if you will, and adjust. I know they're over there as well. Okay, just look at, while I'm doing a catch-up, Stephen's going to walk around the church and check the various. If the air con near you is just freezing you out, just wave your hand right now and Stephen will look and he'll come your way in just a minute. So, you should go right ahead. This, this, is, part of, this is part of being in church. Me, I'm really enjoying this really cool air because, you know, in Sichuan, we did not have this. But the Lord gave us some clouds, so that was, that was great. Um, and we've been talking about, I've been, we've been looking at how the Holy Spirit brings us to the point of salvation, every one of us. Some of the things were at times a little bit different, but for every one of us, the only way you and I ever got to the point where we prayed the sinner's prayer, where we said, oh God, in whatever way you said it, in whatever language, the only way you got to that point was because the Holy Spirit drew you and then you responded, you, pull, you came to His drawing. You, fo you followed Him when He started to pull your heart. And when He convicted you of sin, you repented. Same thing for me, all of us. And then we, we've talked about what the Holy Spirit does at the moment we are saved. And it's kind of wonderful, isn't it? That's what we've been, that's what we've been talking about the last two weeks. Uh, what are some of the things? He convicts us as we move towards Him in, instead of away from Him. And then at the moment we are saved, He gives new life. It's God life. It's spiritual DNA. It's a new spiritual DNA in us. Under our, in our old lives, our spiritual DNA was dead. It was completely broken. There was nothing that could produce life in our old spiritual DNA. But the Holy Spirit came, and at that moment, He gave us God DNA. Really, that's what it is, God DNA. And then He changes our citizenship. We talked about that. We were citizens of this world. He's made us citizens of heaven. That's in Philippians chapter 3. Um, and then what else does He do? He brings us into the family of God. He truly makes us part of His family. And so when you read the New Testament and when it talks about sons of God, daughters of God, they use the word sons. And those of us that are women sometimes feel like I'm left out. I'm, not, I'm a daughter. I'm not a son. But that's the Greek way of talking about it. And so when you see sons of God, that means you and that means me as well. And then when it talks about being heirs, that's because we're now the children of God. He, God really means that, brothers and sisters. He really means it. And then the New Testament has so much to say about the inheritance that you and I will have because we're children and because we're heirs. So that's part of it. He identifies us, the Holy Spirit identifies you and me as belonging to God. You are now His child, spiritually. Just as surely as I can look at some of you and physically I look at your children and it is so, so clear that your children are identified with you. I mean, is there any question that David Hibombo is a Hibombo? No question whatsoever. Is there any question that Kathleen, I know she's an adult, but still, is there any question that Kathleen is not an Austria? Any question at all? 
Of course not. So clear. It's so, so clear. Is there any question that which family Nat Nat comes from? No question whatsoever. Just as it is true in the physical, just as it's true in the physical, it is equally true spiritually. It's true spiritually. You are now identified. You're identified with God. So this is what he does. Oh, how wonderful. How wonderful the Holy Spirit is. He becomes, at the moment you're saved, he becomes your deposit or your guarantee of what God will completely finish in your life one day in the future. Actually, that's what we're going to talk about this morning. So what about now? You're saved. I, I don't know everybody here, but I imagine most, if not all of us this morning, are born again. Right? I'm pretty sure. Okay. So you're now saved. Holy Spirit's done His work. You're not a friend. You're not an enemy of God anymore. You're a friend of God now. You have a new life. You're on your way to heaven. Bon voyage. Good luck. Is that it? Of course not. The Holy Spirit still has a work to do in your life and in my life. And He's doing it right now. He's doing it this morning. He's been doing it. And so I want us to look at what the Holy Spirit continues to do in you and me. And I don't want this to be a, like, and now here's an academic for le lesson for you. Please remember these three points. This is what the Holy Spirit does. But I think it helps us to see what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives so that we can work with Him and not against Him. Because sometimes, honestly, don't you work against the Holy Spirit sometimes in your life? I do. I do. And so it's good to know this is what the Holy Spirit is trying to do in your life. And so I cooperate with that. You cooperate with that. And it helps us to see the continuing and the active work of God in our lives. Because sometimes you and I, we get saved. And then sometimes it almost seems like we as we always would do in the U.S. where there are a lot of big highways, we always put a car on cruise control. I mean, every American car has cruise control. You push the button, you take your foot off the accelerator or off the gas pedal, and all you have is your hands on the wheel and you just drive. You don't have, yeah, it's great. <laughs> it's, just, it's just great, okay? Oh, it, it's, it's really, you could almost never do that in Hong Kong, could you? With the with the trap, if you unless you want to wreck, right? Um, and then you put hit the hit the foot on the brake and whatever. And so, to tell you the truth, I've driven so long in Hong Kong now that when I'm in the U.S., I don't like to use cruise control because I feel out of control. But in fact, it's a very very safe thing. So, but sometimes as Christians, we get like that too, don't we? We sort of get. We, we sort of, our Christian lives are sort of in cruise control, aren't we? We're just kind of going along, and we almost feel like, well, God's not really doing anything. But what I want us to see this morning is the Holy Spirit is so active. He's so active in your life and in my life. He is the active agent in your salvation and your progressive Christian walk. It is the Holy Spirit's responsibility to get you and me from where we are now all the way to the end point to heaven. That's his job. Does that mean, oh, you get to sit back and rest? No. You and I cooperate and work with him, but I want us to see what the Holy Spirit is doing this morning. There's so many things that we could look at, but I want to just focus on about three things this morning. There's so, so many things, and we can read. Maybe we'll come back to it later, but for this morning, we're going to focus on three things. And one of the things that the Holy Spirit works to do always in your life and my life is he continually assures us of our relationship with God. He continually assures us of our relationship with God. Many years ago, when my brother was very young, apparently my sister and I were bad sisters, apparently. I don't really recall, but my mom tells me that, um, that we gave our brother a hard time. Philip was six years younger than I was, so he was, he was quite a bit younger. He had come along, and Philip was a surprise, um, but they were so happy. And my sister and I, who were only about a, 
year and a half or so, just under two years apart, we would tell Philip when he was very small, we would tell him, you're adopted. <laughs> we would tell him, you're adopted. And I think back now, I think, I can't. I can't believe we were so mean, really. So Joshua, don't tell David that. David, there's no way. I, I saw you when you were born in the hospital. You're not adopted. Whatever Joshua tells you, okay? <laughs> Nat, Nat, I was there. Whatever Melro, Auntie Melrose tells you, you're not adopted, okay? And at one point it was so bad that Philip decided to run away from home. But he didn't get very far. He, you know, after about 100 yards he came back. And so mean, right? I am so sorry. The Lord has forgiven me for that. This is an earthly example. And he came back home and he told mom what my sister Rebecca and I had said. You're adopted. You're adopted. And, and you know, he was a little guy. We were so mean. <laughs> really, we were mean. But the uncertainty that filled his heart, it really, it really messed him up. And I would never do that. I, I, I look back and I think, God, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry. But I remember Mom told me what she told Philip. And she said, Philip, look in the mirror. Look at your nose. How could you be adopted? You're a Nolan. And Philip looked in the mirror and he looked at his nose. And that settled it for him. He was reassured that indeed he was in the family, that he had a blood relationship with mom and dad and with my sister and me. He was not, he, he was part of the family. He was part of the family. Um, and in fact, if you look at, this tells you how mean I was, if you look at young pictures of my brother and me, some people can't tell us apart. That's how similar we are. That's how similar we are. What does the Holy Spirit do in your life and my life? He continually assures you of your relationship with God. That's what He does. Now, I've told you a funny story, which is true. I promise you, and if you ever see Mom again on this side, you can say, Mom, did Pastor Jennifer really tell Brother Philip that he was adopted? And she will tell you, yes, she did. And I've told you a funny story just to make a point but it's a much more important point than my brother and me. And that is that the Holy Spirit works in your life and my life to really reassure your heart. You are in the family. You belong to God. Now, why is this important? Does it just make you feel better? It's just a feeling thing? I think it's much more important than that because this is one of the areas that I believe the enemy attacks in our lives, doesn't he? Does he ever attack you in this area? You feel like I'm not a Christian. You feel like I have failed so much. God's really disappointed with me. I don't even, I don't really know, I don't even know that I'm really born again anymore. I feel like I'm outside of God's love. And we question, God, do you really love me? God, am I really part of your family? Am I really held by you? Am I really in your hands? And I don't know about you, but this is something at a younger, at a, at a younger age in my life, I really struggled with it. God, do you really love me? And I don't know if some of you struggle with that sometimes. Maybe you don't. I did. God, do you really love me? And God, through the Holy Spirit, confirmed to my heart, spoke so strongly through, through to my heart, through another person who did not know me. He had no idea. We had never met before. And I was in a meeting in Thailand. And earlier that day, I'd been sitting on the beach and I'd gone through some things that had been really tough in China, and it'd been, there'd been a lot of up and down. And I knew in my head that God loved me. I knew in my head. I knew the Word of God. And the thing is, you know the Word of God too, don't you? We know the Word of God. We know what He says in His Word about His love for us and, how, and what He has done for us. But sometimes in our hearts, we don't feel it and we re respond, and the enemy really attacks. It is so often in this area, it is the work of the enemy. And I remember sitting on the beach by myself, Sister Betty was somewhere else, and I was sitting there and I was crying. And I said, God, do you really love me? I I'm being really honest with you, it was, before I was, uh, it was before I was a pastor, I think I was in my early 30s at that time. And I said, God, can you, can you show me you love me? Lord, can you 
please show me that you love me. I don't feel that you love me. And in my head, I knew it all. I did, brothers and sisters. I knew it all. And that evening, there was a gathering. I was at a Christian guest house. And that evening, there was a, a, a man, a, two men from the U.S. that were there. And they were just preaching, and they were leading worship. And they were re, uh, bringing refreshment, if you will, to the group. We were all missionaries that were there. And we'd had worship, and then we'd had, they'd, they'd spoken for a while. And then at the end, and suddenly this man just said, he just stood up and he said, he said, um, he said, I just want to say, I just want you to know, the Holy Spirit wants you to know tonight that God really loves you. <laughs> True. That, and He wants you to know that He really, really loves you. So you need to know that tonight. God really cares for you. He loves you so much. And that settled it for me. It was, it was so clear. It was the Holy Spirit speaking through somebody who was sensitive to Him. And, and for me, that settled it. And for me, that settled it. And you know what? Ever since then, I have stood on that. I have stood on that. And it was a reminder, God, you love me. And then the Holy Spirit works to confirm. That's one of the things that He does. That's one of the things that He does. He not only, as we read the Bible, He not only makes truth real to us, that He loves us, but then He also deals with our hearts, because our hearts are important too, aren't they? It's where our feelings are. This morning as we were singing, um, as we were singing Amazing Grace, did you feel, many of you, I, be, I know He was speaking to my heart again, did you feel the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart this morning? Yes or no? Yes, you did. Now why did Brother Stephen choose that song this morning? Because he liked the words? No. Well, he liked the words, but because he prayed and the Holy Spirit led him to, the, to those songs this morning. And how much did the words of the song minister to us this morning? Yes? As we were singing, my chains are gone, I've been set free, amazing grace, through many dangers, toils, and snares, the Holy Spirit was just I don't know about you, but he was just speaking to my heart this morning and just confirming and, and comforting and reassuring my heart. Was he doing that for you this morning or was it just for me? Was it just, I know it wasn't just for me. I could feel the Holy Spirit moving and working. Beloved, beloved this morning, I just, I just, want, to, just want to reassure you and confirm to you, that's the Holy Spirit's work. It, he's so wonderful, isn't he? He's so wonderful in our hearts and in our lives. And He can take one word and one song and, and, and speak to, to maybe Tom and Tom in one way and Iris in one way. And then over here He can take the same words of the song and, and, deal, with, and deal with Alfred in another way because He's the Holy Spirit. And so He works to assure you of your relationship with Him. And He does that in so many ways. Sometimes it is through, I love you. Sometimes it is, oh, receiving the grace of the Lord. Sometimes it's hearing something that you needed to hear. Some of you this morning at the end when I shared that about the Holy Spirit needing a direction from the Lord, that was just what you needed to hear this morning. And I'm not proud and I'm not, oh, I had that all prepared. No, the Holy Spirit just spoke that to me as we reached the end. And I, and I knew, okay, Holy Spirit, you want to reassure people. You want to give some guidance in this area. And I know He did. I know He did this morning because that's His job. It's His job to do that. Let's look at, uh, look at the Second Corinthians. We've looked at this one before, the next slide. Look at this again just as a reminder of what God does, and Galatians as well. I'll move out of the way in just a minute. But look at these two as a reminder of what the Holy Spirit does in your life and in my life. In 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22, it's God who enables us along with you. I love this. Paul is, here's big Paul. You know, he's this great evangelist, and he includes himself in what the Holy Spirit does. He says, it's God who helps us to stand firm for Christ. If anybody could have had confidence in standing for Christ, it would have been Paul. But Paul says it's God who enables us. It's God who helps us. So that encourages me when I feel weak, as I do sometimes. It should encourage you when you feel weak sometimes. God is the one who keeps you strong. He has commissioned us. Also, He's called you. What does a commission mean? It's a calling. It's a, he's, put his, he's put His hands upon you, if you will. He's commissioned you. He's identified us as His own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment 
that guarantees everything he's promised us. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later, so just kind of keep that in mind. But he has identified us as his own. But continue further, look at Galatians 4, 6 through 7. That may be a little bit difficult to read because it's low. And because we are his children, so here's the work of the Holy Spirit, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts prompting us to call out what? Abba Father. Abba Father. Now remember we talked about Abba Father. That meaning is what? Daddy. Close. It's a close thing. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit brings us. He, he's, he's in our hearts and He's working to remind us of the relationship, the good relationship that we have with God. And then look at verse 7 and we're going to come back to this one later as well. Now, you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you're his child, God has made you his heir. Do you see something here in these two verses? Here's the Holy Spirit working at this present moment, but do you see what the Holy Spirit is always doing as well? There's something in the future, isn't there? There's something that's coming. There's something that's yet ahead. Is it Gold, because we get to walk on streets of gold, phooey. <laughs> I think we won't care about gold when we get to heaven. Is it pearls, because the, the gate of the city is made of a great pearl? Wow, that's going to be... No, because we have the pearl of great price in Jesus. In Jesus. It's going to be other things that we're going to see that. We'll, we'll, Lord willing, we're going to get to that this morning. I think we will. Um, so we see, we see the work of the Holy Spirit is there a story in the New Testament that reminds us of how the Holy Spirit is? Because the Holy Spirit is like Jesus, and Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So the three are as one, right? Is there a parable in the New Testament that reminds us of the love of the Father? Can you think of a parable? The prodigal son, right? The parable of the prodigal son. You know what? We always call that the parable of the prodigal son. But do you know what? That parable is not really about the prodigal son. Did you know that? Do you know who that parable is really about? It's about the faithful father. It's about the loving father. Now look at that. Look at that. And then I want us to think about the parable for just a minute. We're no longer a slave, but we're God's own child. He's made us his heir. The son has gone away. He's rebelled against the father. Is he, still, is he still a son? He has the blood of the father in him. He's still a son. But he comes to the place where he believes what I have done with my life disqualifies me from being a son. And he comes to himself and he goes back to the father. And what does he say to the father? What does he say? I'm no longer worthy, right? I'm no longer worthy of being called a son. Make me a servant or a slave is really what it means. What, has the, what does the father do? He sees him from far away. And what does the father do? He runs to him. What does he do next? He hugs him. This was a dirty, stinky, smelly son. He'd been, with, he'd been sleeping with the pigs. What a picture of our condition as well. He's sleeping with the pigs and the father embraces him, embraces him, and then what else does he do? He kisses him. That was the Middle Eastern custom. He kissed him. He would have kissed him on both cheeks or more. And then what does he do next? He, that's right. He says, get the ring and put the ring on his finger. What did the ring mean? The ring had to do with authority and relationship, restoration, then what else did he say? Put on the robe. And it was the festive robe, so it was a celebration. It was a celebration. And then one more thing. What did he say? Do you remember this? What did he say? That's right. Put sandals on his feet. Remember what we talked about a couple of weeks ago? Slaves in the New Testament and servants in the, in the New Testament, generally in the Roman world, they did not wear 
shoes or sandals that marked them as slaves and servants. It marked their position. They were not free. They were not their own. What does the father do in that story? He puts shoes on his feet. What does that say in a simple symbol? It says, you are not a slave. You are not a servant. You are my son. You are my son. And that's a beautiful picture of what the Holy Spirit does in your life and in my life in reminding us of our relationship with a loving Father. Brothers and sisters, I don't care how far you've gone away. God doesn't care how far you've gone away except that it has grieved His heart because He loves you. When you return to Him, God your loving Father and the work of the Holy Spirit says you are not a slave, you are not a servant, you are my child. The ring on the finger says you, are, you belong to this family. The robe says I rejoice over your return. Rejoicing! We're crying tears of sorrow, aren't we? We're crying tears of sorrow at things we've done, at, at wasted at wasted lives. And the Father is crying tears of joy and rejoicing because His Son, because His child has returned. And He puts the, feet, he puts the shoes back on our feet, which reminds you and me we are part of the family of God. He does not, that's why the Bible says, that's why the Bible says, He does not treat us as our sins deserve. Do you know that, that, that verse? I don't even remember where it is. He does, if He treated us as our sins deserved, we would be slaves and servants to God, right? But He says, ring, put on the ring, put on the robe, put shoes on, because He does not treat us as our sins deserve. He treats us as He loves us, as His children. And that's the picture that the whole, that's the picture of the Holy Spirit in your life and in my life. Look at Romans 8, 15 and 16. This is a, a follow-up to those two verses that we just read, and this is what a wonderful reminder. He says, Paul says to you and to me this morning, listen, so you have not received a spirit, it's the Holy Spirit, right? You've not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when He adopted you as His own children. And now we call Him Abba Father. For His Spirit joins with our spirit to do what? To affirm that we are God's children. Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad? I'm so thankful for that. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I think that's something that a lot of us need to be reminded of and need to hear this morning. He affirms, if there is a voice that says to you, you are not worthy and God is angry with you, if there's a voice that said you don't really deserve to be God's child anymore, let me tell you whose voice that is. It's the devil's voice. It's the enemy's voice because God does not say that to you. Everything in His Word tells us otherwise. And so the work of the Holy Spirit in your life this morning and in my life this morning is to reaffirm our relationship with God. Amen? Amen. 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 What else does the Holy Spirit do? Let's look at the next thing. And this is such an important part in our lives as well. We sometimes do fail, don't we? We sometimes do fall short. Some of you may have fallen short this morning. That was, whew. that was not from heaven. That was my hand. Sorry, I was emphasizing. I was making a point. You're awake now, aren't you? But sometimes we do fall short, don't we? Sometimes we do miss the mark, don't we? Sometimes we blow it. We really blow it. When that happens, can we just tell ourselves? Well, God loves me, it's okay. We should tell ourselves, God still loves me. But we can't just say, it doesn't matter, it's okay. Because it does matter. It does matter. Do we still have a relationship with God? Uh, uh, next slide. 
There we go. The Holy Spirit works to restore our right fellowship with God when we fail. We still have relationship with God, don't we? We still have relationship. But fellowship is damaged when we fail. It is. It's damaged. May I give you an example? Let's say a husband and a wife. Okay, now I'm going to use Keith and B because Keith is up here on the second row and B has left her husband and is now on row five. <laughs> but I think it's because of the cold air because yeah. <laughs> she's holding a sweater. But let's say that Keith and B, you know that they're husband and wife, Keith and B get into somebody's, they're both upset about something and somebody says, one of them, I won't say who, one of them says something that is hurtful and painful, okay? Whatever it is. They say something that's sharp and it really hurts the heart. Now, are they still husband and wife? Yes. yes, they're still husband and wife. But has their fellowship been damaged at that point? Yes, it has been. It has been. And something has to be done to restore fellowship. Can't just say, well, we're husband and wife, so it's okay. We'll get over it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't usually work that way, does it? You have to deal with it. You have to take care of it. You have to take care of it. And so the Holy Spirit works when you have failed, when you have blown it, when you feel God doesn't love me anymore. The Holy Spirit reminds you God loves you, but the Holy Spirit, because He's holy and because He's God, then works to restore the fellowship that you have with God. The devil, when you fail and when you fall, same thing for me, same thing for every one of us. So often when we blow it, the first thing we want to do is stay away from God. Yeah? Yes. You don't want to pray, really. You don't really want to read your Bible. You don't really want to kind of whatever. You kind of... <laughs> you sort of stay around the edges. Do you know what I mean? And you don't really want to think about it very much, right? That's because that you know how I you know how I can describe that so well? <laughs> I do the same thing. Because that's human nature. We're all that way. We're all that way. That's the voice of the enemy, and that's our fallen nature, our old fallen nature that wants us to do that. Because the Holy Spirit will always, always, always work to pull you back to God, to draw you back to God. He always wants you to come back to Him, to come back to Him. That is His work. That is His work. One of the things that happens when you and I sin and when you and I fail is that in our hearts there's a grief, isn't there? Have you ever felt grief at your sin? Have you ever felt sorry you've done something you like, and you just you're so, you say, oh God, you almost can't believe yourself, can you? And you just think, God, how could I do that? How could I say that? And there's such a grief in your heart. And then you ask God to forgive you, yes or no? Yes. You do. Let me ask you something. When you ask God to forgive you, do you always feel immediate joy? No, you don't always feel immediate joy. Well, what's going on? Sometimes when we don't feel immediate joy, you know what we think? What do we think? Thank you. That's right. God hasn't really forgiven me yet, right? He hasn't really forgiven. Remember I told you that story one time about two sisters in Lighthouse. They came into the office to talk to me. They were best of friends. They'd had a disagreement. And then one had tried to make it up and had tried to apologize. And the other one didn't want to talk. Didn't want to talk. Some of you remember this now, don't you? Didn't want to talk. Didn't want to talk. They came into the office the one that wanted to restore the, fr the fellowship and the relationship with her best friend, both of them Christians, in Lighthouse a long time ago, I saw her get on her knees in the office, and I've told some of you this before, get on her knees in the office before her friend. I didn't ask her to do that. And she said, I'm really sorry, and she really was. And she said, please forgive me. And the friend said, I will. <laughs> But not yet. <laughs> Blew my mind. I thought, I, I, I kind of went, I was like a fish for a little while. 
<laughs> I didn't know what to say. And, and finally, I just said, well, she has done her part. It's up to you. But if you hold this in your heart, this will damage you. And not long after that, that, one, that sister left the church left the church because she held it in her heart. And we sometimes think God is like that, that He withholds forgiveness because we still feel badly in our hearts, right? That that feeling in our hearts is a, is a sign that, that God has not forgiven us. Remember what David said after he had sinned so greatly? This is in Psalm 51. Remember that? Let me ask you something. David wrote that psalm, my sin is ever before me. It's like my bones are broken. Oh, and he grieves and he pours out his heart before the Lord. Do you think David had repented already by that point? Oh, of course he had. Of course he had repented. And remember what he said to the Lord? He said, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Restore the joy of my salvation. David knew that God had forgiven him. He said, my sin is ever before me. And sometimes we feel that way. Do you know what I want to say to you this morning? Please don't take this the wrong way. I believe that sometimes that godly sorrow is good for us. I think it's good for us because it works in our hearts to remind us of the seriousness of sin, of the cost of sin, and the cost of forgiveness because the cost of forgiveness is heavy. It was the life of Jesus on the cross, His body broken and His blood poured out. And I, I thank God for the working of godly sorrow in my life that reminds me, God, I don't want to do that again. I don't want to do it again. And I believe the Holy Spirit uses godly sorrow in our lives to, to make the work of repentance deep and real and not cheap and not easy. Amen? I, I really believe that. But at the same time, when we continue to live with, oh, when you, if you live under a cloud and you live under guilt all the time, I did this and I did that, I want to say something to you. That is not the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not the work of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit works to restore, to restore. I want, to look, I want, you, I want us to look at a verse also. When we fail and when we fall, sometimes all we feel is our sorrow, don't we? We feel like, oh, my heart feels so bad. Look at Ephesians 4.30. Paul writes, he says, do not and do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way that you live. Sorrow or do not grieve the Holy Spirit. When, when preachers talk about grieving the Holy Spirit, this is, this is the verse that it comes from. And do not bring sorrow. And so that is a reminder to us that when we sin and that when we fall, guess what? It's that, that sorrow or that grief, and this kind of, I don't completely understand this. How does God feel that? I, I don't really know. How does the Holy Spirit feel that? I don't, I can only understand it in human terms, right? But how many of you, you've had a, you've had a disagreement, you've had a, a falling out with a close friend, and you make up, and you make it right, but still for a while, sometimes there will be grief, won't there? There'll be sorrow on bo both sides for the pain that was caused. And we, we feel it. Like, I'm really, and sometimes we may, we may even say, I'm really, really sorry. Even though we've already said sorry, right? And I, I, think, I, I think sometimes, I think that's okay. It makes it deep. It makes it a deep work in our hearts. But this, this shows us that when we fail and when we fall, we are not the only ones who feel grief and sorrow for it. There is a grief and a sorrow on the Holy Spirit's side as well. Why? Because He's made His home in you and in His very nature, who He is. He is what? He's holy. He's holy. And when I do something and when I say something and when I think something and when I act in a way that's not holy and it's not like Jesus, I grieve Him too because He's my friend. I have a relationship with Him, and I am grieved as well. And so the Holy Spirit works in your life and my life to restore the fellowship that we have with God. Then, When you fail and when you fall, do not let the enemy deceive you and make you think, God no longer loves me. 
He loves you. That's what the Holy Spirit does. But He will also work to bring you back into right fellowship with God. Don't wait. Don't say, I will. Later. <laughs> Go right away and take care of it. Amen? Amen. 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 That's what he works to do. That's what he works to do. May I tell you one good thing about that grief that you feel in your heart and in your life when you've sinned and when you've fallen short? Do you know that that grief that you feel, it is a sign that the Holy Spirit has made his home in you? Did you know that? It's a sign the Holy Spirit has made his home in you. Remember before when you used to sin? Before you were a child of God? Ah, you could do almost anything. And, and you didn't think about it, right? You didn't care about it. Oh, maybe you, sometimes you felt a little bit badly about it, but it didn't really bother you very much. But when you and I are children of God, when the Holy Spirit makes His home in us, He is. He's living in there now. And then we fall short, and we have that, that grief. We have that grief in our heart. It is a sign. It is truly a mark that the Holy Spirit is living in you and he's given you spiritual DNA and you're sensitive to your own sin and you're sensitive to the sin of the world around you aren't you have you ever seen things in the world around you sometimes you hear about it or you see it and you just go oh, and it just hurts your heart it just hurts your heart and you think how can they say that how can they do that how can that be that's there's a human response but it's beyond the human response it is God's DNA in you, it's the spiritual life in you that is grieved because He's holy and He makes you holy and He makes me holy as well. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so He works in you and me, and we're going to stop with this last slide. We've got, yeah, we've got more to go, but we're going to stop with this last slide. He works in you and me to make us holy, to get us right and to make us holy. He's making us more like Jesus in our thoughts, in our deeds, in our desires, and we cannot do it by ourselves. We cannot do it by ourselves. You cannot decide to be better as a Christian. You're not strong enough, and I'm not strong enough. Your sinful nature is stronger than you. You say, sinful nature? Do I still have a sinful nature? Yep, you still have a sinful nature. And you say, but I don't want a sinful nature. You will have a sinful nature until the final redemption. That's part of it. That's part of it. That part of it is great. We're going to talk about it next week. It's, it's so great. We're going to talk about the final redemption and the final when we get our new bodies. And we're going to talk about why that's so wonderful. A bunch of you, you've never even thought about it very much before. You've kind of thought, well, I'll get a new body and I won't have arthritis anymore. My back won't hurt anymore. Won't that be great? My beloved brothers and sisters, that is the least of it. That's the least of it. Of it. But what we have that we have a taste of right now is what is yet ahead. That's what's going to be so wonderful. Next week we're going to talk about it. But let's close with this verse. Romans 8, 12 through 14. And so here's the Holy Spirit working in us. In, in my life, the pull of sin is so powerful, and it's powerful in your life as well. The ruts in my life of disobedience and self-will are very deep. You know what I mean? You've gone, you and I have gone this way so many times. Gone this, it's like on a road. It's on a dirt road, right? You've gone that way so many times that there's just a deep rut and in myself, if I, once I start to go on that path, there's no way I can move out of that path because the rut is so deep of sin and self-will in my life. So it's going to take something really, really powerful to break that. Thank the Lord we have the Holy Spirit. And we read in Romans 8, 12 through 14, Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its demands, you will die and I will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. You will live. And so the power of the Spirit at work in your life and my life, cooperating with Him. That's why I can't just say, okay, God, make me holy. Do, do you ever wish that? Oh, God, just change me. Make me holy. Nope. It's cooperation. That's why we're talking about the work of the Holy Spirit. 
It's cooperation with the Holy Spirit. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. And the Holy Spirit has come to, in our lives, to work and to give us life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for your truth. Holy Spirit, we really thank you. We really thank you. We are so grateful for your work in our lives since we've become Christians, for your ongoing work, even now, even this morning. We have seen you and we have felt you working in our lives and in our situations. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.